sponsoring. So please, if you know that there are companies that uh, they would be or they would like to be a sponsor, please tell us something because uh, I think we, we can grow in this direction. And like this, uh, I mean, like these options and, and activities, we would like to attend and receive more great speakers. So uh, you are welcome to send us a message and say that, okay, I know that guy and he's just an expert on this technology and they are working in, in this other thing and, and things like that. So please tell us something. Uh, that's it. I mean, for the new guys, we have a lot of uh, channels to communicate with us. We have Twitter and Google Plus, and uh, uh, one of them is just working very well with the Meetup. Uh, there's a lot of people that come from Meetup uh, because it's, I'm not sure why, but anytime we are publishing an event, it seems that Java is the first one and uh, it's Barcelona, and we are moving in the first in the first place, I don't know why. And then we have a Google Groups and, and, and for a third, our main website, a kind of a blog when we announce everything. So please uh, check out and then send us a message if you want to Twitter and use the hashtag and it's free. Okay? And please, we would like to receive some kind of message from your site. And that's it. I mean, I'm only uh, stealing about a few minutes from, from Jonas. Uh, announcing the next event is from the next week, uh, I think it's on Saturday. Yeah, and we are going to organize with the, with the help of Capsite. Capsite is a company, uh, it's a partner with Amazon Web Service, and they are, we are going to try to organize a kind of workshop working with Amazon and the cloud, and we will build like a two teams, and we will create different kind of a, virtual machines and then we try to bring information from one side and then push from the other side and see what happens with your uh, with your cloud. So if you want, be careful because this event will be on Saturday and will be, uh, I think it was about 25 to 30 rooms, uh, so uh, it's, not, it's not a huge event for all of you. So when we announce this one, be careful, be quick, it will be empty so far. And uh, I think it's an interesting event because uh, there's a lot of things you can do in the cloud and this is a kind of practical and play event. And we have a lot of ideas and a lot of technology behind, but please tell us what, what do you prefer. We, we would like to talk about Cassandra. Who knows Cassandra here? Who is playing with Cassandra? Nobody knows who, nobody knows who is, what is Cassandra? Oh yeah, it's a writer. Okay, we, we, we would like to play with Cassandra, we would like to understand which are the benefits of Cassandra, but also with Guava, you know, or guys, for example. There's a lot of frameworks over there that, that they are amazing. And a lot of uh, OGI, another kind of uh, technology that is really understandable and interesting for peace. Give us, give us some feedback about, about what you like, what are the next proposal. And that's it. I mean, the next seven seconds to follow that will be organized. I'm sure because the mobile work is uh, at the end of this month and uh, we have place here rented and but we are not sure because if mobile work congress is over there maybe we are trying to organize something and you know, not the people is not coming here so maybe we we organize the next events on march or if you want um, but that's it i mean tell us something about what are your proposals and that's it i mean for the new people come on you are welcome uh, of course, is you are part of the community, and that's it. I mean, join us. Tell us what do you like, what do you prefer, and which are your your yes, your yes, uh, ideas. So that's it from my side. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. In the, in the other side. <laughs> yeah. What's that? I know what they yeah. Sorry. What's that? I don't know what they Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
others well, that didn't uh, underlie behind this framework that we keep starting thing 14 years ago. Uh, who has been using Gordon? You're a bit right <laughs> out. Uh, who, been, who has been using Tilbury P? Google what to do? Same guys. Okay. <laughs> so we have a lot of people who should be learning Gordon tonight. I hope all of you are body users tomorrow. <laughs> so, I don't know what we're going to be talking about. I thought of giving an intro and then maybe kind of diving a bit deeper what's happening at the moment in body, but I, I would like that it would be up to you to actually what we're speaking about. So please ask questions and kind of push me to whatever direction you want to. And we'll see what it goes. But if you are silent, uh, I'm giving an intro, giving a, a small coding demo, and then maybe showing what's new in Vardy 7, how it's related to Google Web Toolkit, and please have any questions. It, it is going to be boring if you are not kind of challenging me with questions. So what is Vardy? Um, our team is mainly in Finland, so we are 75 guys at the moment, mostly in Finland, we are California as well, uh, but the origins are in Finland, so what is actually a Finnish word, it means female reindeer. In practice it's more of a framework for building rich web applications. <coughs> this rich web thing here means that applications that would more or, more or less look and feel like desktop applications, but would be running in a web browser. So something that you would have been doing with Swing in the past, you can clearly do it quite, but of course you can also do really webby application with that. By as being uh, towards business applications, so it's mostly used for like boring business applications, not that much for websites. In the end of the day, I guess it's mostly about UI components, so there are tons and tons of UI components, something like 100 UI components in the core framework, and over 400 UI components outside of the core framework, so there are tons of components, and this is the key why people are using Bonnet, so that they get beautiful, ready-made components to work with. Well, the components are in the core, or...? No, the, the, in the core we have maybe around 100 or so components, but there is super active uh, user community around it, and we are having things that we call Bonnet directory, so anybody can push Bonnet plugins in there, okay. and at the moment we have like 500, uh, 400 plugins, some of these are components, some of these are component libraries, so extra number of atom components is a bit hard to count. Some of them are uh, commercial and others uh, are actually, free? Actually, almost everything is free. Okay. Uh, what kind of makes one different is probably our focus. So we try to focus in two things, basically you know, the productivity and rich user experience. So we try to go by these two, and it's you will see it's quite different from many other things because of this focus. We try to minimize the number of code lines you write, and we try to minimize the amount of time it takes to write with beautiful application. And we do make compromises to get over there. So the philosophy is kind of you take HTML and you abstract, abstract away from that, put Java on top of that, and we try to kind of make HTML kind of bridge between this these two platforms, HTML and Java, but they it in a such way that it could mostly be writing up against the entire of Java code. So what would anybody want to do with this? So why would somebody want to actually find this beautiful HTML behind it? Um, I guess you have seen plenty of really nice looking consumer applications, like that kind of thing. So these great expectations, and then people know that it's going to be possible to create those beautiful applications. They kind of are, if you're working in Java, you're mostly building business applications anyways, I guess. So those expectations are carried over to your workplace, and then you are working with different applications that are totally horrible looking. And somehow the consumers that go to work they expect that you do something beautiful and then you deliver this and then they think that you can work properly. 
So, the, the reason is that the, the budgets are unrealistic. So basically, those guys creating consumer applications, this has a lot of millions of users, and you are targeting maybe 500 users or 100 users. And at the same time, these guys who are building for the consumers, they are not building large applications, they are building pretty small applications. Facebook, how many pages do you have in Facebook? I mean, like different type of pages. Not too many. And if you're building a serum system or kind of bank finance or maintenance, whatever system, it typically has tons and tons of other product UIs. And these guys may be charging only like euro per user per year as ads. And then you can maybe charge 500 euros per user per year. And even then, the system is pretty expensive and the, and the customer knows that it's too expensive. But if you do the math, you actually can see that these guys can spend like 100,000 per view and you have to spend like 5,000 per view and then the expectations are the same. Why do you deliver horrible looking UIs? And the reason is that it's actually pretty damn hard to do those UIs properly. So those Facebook guys, they build everything out of dips and, and tube the dome forever. And we try to somehow solve this problem, in a, in a way make it easy to build those nice looking applications with a limited budget. So we do this in, in three ways. Uh, the first idea being that everything that we build is built out of components. So we have like UI components, we have themes, we have data sources. So you think like ready-made things, ready-made components, combine these to build your application, instead of building everything from scratch. Uh, maybe a, a demo of what it looks like. The project was, it doesn't give the best view of how beautiful the components are. Let's see if you can fix it somehow. Yeah. So let's set up on Chrome and see one of the kind of demos. It's basically like, I would say, kit sensing application in, in body. Full screen. So, uh, you can basically kind of uh, dive through all kinds of UI components in the framework. Let's take some simple example like date field here. So you can basically try out all the components by yourself, see how they work. So in this case, when I'm clicking something, you know, shows a notification over here. Uh, the point is that I can actually see the source code here, and I can kind of see how it is built. So I can, yeah. See this kind of component uh, behavior, you're using HTML5, I guess, or...? Yeah, but I'm just using Java over here, so HTML5 is used under the hood by body. You don't have to deal with that directly. No, but what I mean is that, uh, what, uh, does it fall back uh, in a nice way if somebody's using an old browser? Yeah, it does. So, basically, we support everything since IE8. So, IE8, IE9, and everything after that, all the modern web browsers, all the modern uh, mobile platforms and you don't have to install anything for those. Right. But still the code you write is, is pure Java, so you just write a new day field, like you would do in Swing, and you start listening for events like this. Uh, basically, when the user does something, event arrives to your code and you can actually face the back end API directly. Or actually, if you happen to be uh, using Java 8, you can write it in such a way that instead of writing those horrible other machine classes like over here, this is a bit old example, like instantiating this, you can actually use Java 8 and lambdas in a way that it just creates a new button, title, click, and then create a lambda, what happens when I click the button. Uh, what I actually want to show here? Yeah, another thing is that uh, because this is basically a component browser, you, you can go through all the components. You can also kind of tune these components a bit, basically set different properties. So let's see, here I'm showing minutes, so we could say that we want to always say short dates, and we want to put the local to be China. So now we have like Chinese date field. So we can kind of try out how these components behave. And of course there are tons and tons of components, so different components in, in the 
framework. I'm not going in there. Go to demo one in common and you can try out all the components yourself. So if it's, I guess you can spend the rest of the day by clicking next component, write it out, next component, write it out, and so forth. Is uh, writing in Java a good way to add the components? Excuse me? Is the writing Java a good way to add the components? Uh, there are multiple ways. So, uh, most typical is, is like programmatic layout in very lighting swing. You put components inside of uh, horizontal layouts and grid layouts and panels and whatnot. Uh, you can also use HTML templates as you would do in JSPs. There is basically put the tag uh, or kind of marker tag in a page place the component inside here. You could use CSS to lay out. There's also a visual editor where you can drag and drop the layouts and draw the layout. Maybe I'll show you how like a real application looks like because this is certainly not a typical body application. We normally don't do things like Xbox Way. Uh, so let's get another one. This is this is how body applications typically look like. So you might have some kind of login. You might have tons of components on the screen. Um, like some uh, interactive graphics that load more data while you're scrolling. It's typical that you're showing tons of data. For example, in this case, I just put the table on the screen. New table, uh, set data source for the table, and after that, the table starts loading data from the data source automatically. So it's just a couple of lines of code, and you can implement place loading table. Uh, you can build uh, like drag and drop handlers yourself, so it's is to build things where you can drag, drag and drop things around or create a bit uh, fancier layouts yourself. So it's you can do many, many kinds of stuff. Uh, and basically, these UIs, everything you show there, everything is in Java, everything is on the server side. So for this application, I didn't have to write any piece of HTML, no HTML templates, nothing like that. There is a bit of CSS for styling the application. If you use that, the default look and feel it look like the defaults. It will look a bit more like building, how do you say it in a bad way? Uh, building a website in Visual Basic. Uh, I didn't say it. But... <laughs> so you should all, some, always theme a bit. Let's see, what I want to actually show. Hey, this is also quite fancy. So basically, uh, this is the same application run on iPad. So, <coughs> oh, we don't see anything. But anyways, it, it's basically running the same application. And you can do all the same stuff in the iPad without any code modification. So all the rack and drop handles are over there. So they are just run with touch. So it's basically private ones and you can use it anywhere. Uh, it also runs on, on mobile phones. But then you have to do, you have to lay out your components for mobile phone. Obviously, you can run this uh, dashboard application on iPhone, but it's not the nicest thing to use because it will be so small. We support <coughs> all the browsers out there at the moment. Actually, if you happen to be tortured by a company for supporting IE7 and IE6, there is also an old version of Warren that is still support that supports IE6 and 7. I hope nobody's using those. Uh, today is a bit old slide. Today, I guess we have something like 420 or so components in the directory. Uh, I already spoke a bit about that, but let's take an example why it's a good idea not to put everything in the core. So, this is a nice component that looks like a sticky note, but it's a layout component. So, basically, you can put your component inside of those sticky notes and then you can wrap these sticky notes around and totally useful component by the way, nobody is probably using that but it's a good example why you should be putting this kind of component in, in the framework but it's also a good example for what, what you can do in, in kind of packaging components because could you guess how you are actually doing this kind of component how you can create this clear diagonal cut over there any ideas? It's not, it's, it's just kind of like HTML. Uh, so when you do some 
like HTML magic, you can package that as a component that anybody can use, the acre is super simple. In this case, the shadows are painted with canvas and they are like semi-transparent. And then it does the trick of duplicating the dome tray like 10 times uh, and cutting these in a kind of, you don't see it, but actually it's not like we are cut, but there is underneath are some kind of pieces of, of um, uh, blocky dome tray. But it would be super complicated to build this component from scratch, but if you try to download the component and use it, it will be like three lines of code. Um, if you don't want to even download it, you can just cut and paste this uh, home definition from here into your main and compile and it's not to work right away. Themes. Uh, there are multiple themes. So I guess this is the default look and feel. I don't want to show this look and feel is too much because of all the shadows over there, but it's more post kind of built for boring business applications, banking and insurance, and it's just at home in those applications. There is also a bit more graphical, rounded, shaped theme built in. You can also customize the themes, pick the colors. Uh, you can even like change the look and feel as you wish. So I don't know if it's running. Basically, this is the standard component: normal table, some kind of split panel layout over here. Uh, once you start a component, a bit of CSS on top of it, and you start to look like the component is something different. Data sources. So basically, in, in Bardem, we had a problem back in 2002. How should we do these UI components? The, best, uh, the, the traditional visual basic way of doing components was that hey, you have this combo box, and then you say add option, add option, add option, and it kind of contains all those options. And then you have this a bit more fancy Delphi way where you say this combo box that hey, please set the data source for it, and then you have to build the data source somehow. And it turned out that the, the visual basic way was too simple, and sometimes the data source way is just adds code lines. So all the UI components support both external data sources as well as, well as internal data. And the data was pretty simple. There is just three interfaces. Property item and container. So this is basically just one value, this is like back of properties, like object, and the container is like set of those items. So it could be a table, it could be a tree. And if you want to bind your data to any UI component, you just implement this interface and then you can bind it. <coughs> there are some varieties, so you can add like hierarchy or ordering or something like that, but they are optional. The good news is that you don't have to always implement this by yourself. So there are many, many, many implementations, like in-memory implementations, JPA, Hibernate, what have you over there. So actually it's quite rare that you have to implement this yourself. So that was the first thing, kind of, pillar of Bardem. The second thing is uh, for buying quite the server in, in quite strange or wonderful way. It depends on your point of view. <coughs> So if you think of a bridge web application, you basically always have these layers. You have some kind of server, backend server, storing data, visual logic. Then you have a web server that serves the web page. Then you have your UI written in JavaScript, and then there is a communication in between, something about REST, APIs, or something like that. So they are always the same. If that could be written in JavaScript, you would write all of these four layers by yourself. That one in JavaScript, communication layer may be JSON or XML, web server, I don't know, it's sorry, you can use PHP for it if you want to, and then something in the back end. Uh, Google Map Toolkit, or GUID, you should call it nowadays, it, it basically allows you to compile Java to JavaScript. <coughs> and this gives you tons of benefits, so instead of dealing with what easily becomes a spaghetti after five developers and half a year. You can write it in Java and then continue refactoring your code over and over again. So it kind of uh, is. In most cases, it works better. Of course, optionally, you can also write JavaScript in Google Web Toolkit. So you just create a native method. So you can 
write both of these. In Varding, you only have to write these two layers. You only have to write the backend and, and the web server layer. REST is totally optional. So it means that if you write UI over here, these are generated. You don't have to touch these if you don't want to. But you can, if you want to have control over these layers, you can also write these layers. And if you work at the backend for a while, it's actually quite drastic cooperation when you compare having one layer to having three layers. And in many cases, it, it basically means that you can save around half or more than half of your code lines. And that pretty quickly translates to uh, development and maintenance time. So that's the good side of body. I haven't yet got into the bad side of body. So, of course, because you are not writing these layers yourself, or if you are not writing these layers yourself, you lose control of how the communication works, you lose control of how the DOM is manipulated. So it's kind of delegating some of the work from your desk to, to the framework. But how does it work actually? So, what from magic is done? Uh, so we write a piece of code, we write the text to a button, we start listening for enhance. So this is running on the server side. In normal JVM, so you can put breakpoints in there, you can have all the tooling that you are using today. You can actually write this in Scala if you are preferring Scala to Java or whatever language runs over there. But in the end of the day, you start up your browser and go to a web page that actually deals with this. And it works in such a way that this actually loads that normal HTML, CSS, images, JavaScript. But these come from the framework. These are not written by you. So there is around maybe or so of these. <coughs> but this can compress and optimize to from 100k to maybe 300k. So it means that if you are writing a Hello World application, that would be really heavy for a Hello World application. It would be 100k or so. But if you are writing a uh, banking application with hundreds of views, it will be only 300k that gets doubled. So it, it kind of caps, or it works pretty well for large applications, for Hello World application, or for just showing a button on, on the page. It doesn't make that much sense. So these actually render those things on the screen. So they, what it basically sends directives from the server side. Hey, please put this button on the screen, and please put this text field on the screen. It doesn't send HTML. And then I can start interacting with these. I write journals and click the button. What, what happens is that then the Ajax call is sent over the wire, and this Ajax call is around 200 bytes. So it's really small. That goes back to your code, so you only see this Java side of the story. You can modify the UI as you wish. For example, here you are saying, show a notification on the screen. And then what it takes over and kind of understands which part of the screen is, is changed. And sends back a piece of JSON that says that, hey, show a notification on the screen. It doesn't send any HTML, it sends JSON as an instruction on how the screen is changed. So this is how it works. But I will show it in practice it easier that way. Because if I do, I would be kind of preaching that hey, this is really productive to work with. Uh, you would be believing anyway. So let's have a short plotting course instead and write a new application with that. So let's do one in seven. Uh, I basically just build a normal uh, web application, so it can be actually part of your Spring MVC application or combined with any kind of JSPs or what have you over there. <coughs> so let's call this. Uh, Barcelona is actually a good example of application. Barcelona, oh, it's a bit long. Anyways, so then I just choose where I deploy this. Uh, you can deploy to any any Java server. Tomcat this is my my kind of default normally, but you can use like Google App Engine or like full blown JBoss or what have you there. Or you could use also uh, portals if, if that's your thing. Uh, but let's deploy it as a server instead of Portland. Just create an application. What's get created is basically. I tend to use JRevolut. Makes me 
cluster. It's not required by any means. So what's get created over here is only one file. Uh, Betty, this job. Do you see anything in the back? So let's just create it. Uh, simple application stuff that puts a button on the screen. Let's not look at the code yet. I think we have to start from scratch, but let's run it and see if that it works. So I debug it. <coughs> run it on the Tomcat. Okay, so this code basically just creates a button, and when I click the button, it says something. So a couple of things to note. Uh, there is only Java code, there is no HTML at all. I can modify the code here, so instead of saying thank you, I could say Barcelona. Uh, awesome. <coughs> Same, and continue clicking the button, I don't even refresh the page, and it actually modifies the behavior right away. Or I could just make it put, um, let's say, breakpoint over here, like this. And when I click the button, uh, it actually hits the breakpoint right away. And as you can see, it shows a spinner over here, so I can kind of continue working with the breakpoint. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on your application server. So Tomcat, uh, it can uh, do hot code replacement without JRebel. But there are some things that don't work, like if I work, uh, change the class structure, it, uh, then I'm going to restart the server. With JRebel, uh, it kind of survives most of the uh, class structure changes, but for example, if I change uh, or remove the anonymous inner classes, then you have to restart. So you get away with some, some changes and it makes it a bit faster. Some guys just tend to use Teddy because it's so fast to start, so you can just start it and run away. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's see what So what we have over here, we have uh, my user interface, so basically I'm extending from UI class. This means that this is the visible part that we are putting on the web, web page. <coughs> uh, okay, I will define a special theme for, for this application, I don't have to do this, I can just take this away. Uh, I could either use uh, web XML to define that, hey, this UI gets served when the user goes to, to my root URL. In this case, it's easy to just create an empty server and then define that uh, it's open when I go to, to the root URL. And then this init gets run when the user goes first into the application and, and creates the UI. So we could just say set content new label. Hello world. And then I should have hello world over here. But uh, let's instead create like a document management application. So first of all we need a way to choose a document. So let's use like combo box for it. Combo box and call it docs. Like this. And we could say choose a doc. And then we need a class for document to choose from. Uh, I guess in a real world application you would be using MongoDB or JP or something like that. I'm just serving some documents from the disk. Because this is running on the, on the server side, I can actually add access to the disk. So I'll create some files for the data source. So now I have data source 
and then I just bind the data source to my combo box. So that's the like the case where I use data sources. And then put this on the screen. So that was for those. So now we should have this on the screen. Let's see how it looks like. So I have the combo box, it actually reads through these documents from the disk. It has paging, so it shows like 200 uh, documents like this. I can do like auto completion here already. So let's see all the starting with B or buff. So that kind of things are pretty simple to do. But it would be nice to have table over there. So we can use the uh, fact in modern that most of the components they share the same interfaces. So we could actually chase this into a table on the fly like this. And then reload and, and see. And now we have actually a table of components over here with the lazy loading. And it shows the properties. So you can probably see already that it is pretty much pretty much faster to work with high-level components than actually write this out of the So what we want to do next is choose a document that shows us on the screen. So we will create a let's say label to, to contain the document. So it could be empty in the beginning and I want to use uh, HTML for it. So let's put HTML like that. <coughs> also put that on the screen. Maybe we need some layouts as well. Keep it really fast like that. Maybe keep it like hold. 
it only kind of loads new documents when I'm kind of raising my, my keyword here. So that kind of little details will take tons and tons of time to write by yourself. <coughs> what else should we do? Let's make it an editor. Actually, this is just this door because this table is not size <coughs> Pretty much done. And uh, what happened actually is that we were editing this Java source code. So it just kind of serialized it in, in Java source code. So let's save it and start using our new component. So instead of using a label over there, we could use our new editor component. <coughs> and we did declare any constructor parameters.
filter and uh, give up all, all the servlet and then give up a lot of different kind of uh, user interface, how the information works in one, one web page to another or? Uh, no, I didn't plug the question. So the idea is, that you are, as far as I saw, that the first element is a kind of servlet yeah. that builds all the user interface and then you need to build everything from, from this kind of you have a different kind of user interface you are always starting with a kind of server with all the user interface behind. Uh, yeah, so, so the, what I'm doing here in Java, I'm basically kind of composing out of ready-made uh, plain old Java objects. So it's component free in the server memory. And then I'm just attaching this modern server as a glue between web browser and my component free. So this modern server basically takes my component tree and makes sure that it's, it's visible on the web page. It doesn't have to be the whole web page actually, it can be only part of the web page. So if your existing Scratch app, app or not Scratch app, nobody has Scratch apps anymore, but uh, let's say Spring MVC app, you can just add a div over there and then one line of JavaScript say to Bard and start rendering my body components on this div. So in a, in a way it can render into anything. So, what's next? Actually, hey, one pointer. If you want to kind of take a peek of this application yourself, uh, I hope to have it in GitHub as, as well. So just go to github.com slash body and I'm sure it will be fun over there. So those are the two, two first pillars of body. Like everything is a component and really powerful program on the compiled server side and client side. The third thing is that we are we are doing really nothing special. We are just embracing what is there already. So we are building in everything on top of Java. And it means that basically anything that can run on JVM can be driving hard in your eyes. Uh, there are people building in Scala or Ruby or Culture at the moment. But the most horrific example that I saw was some Guy building, I guess that was body, body UIs and Cobol, and it was it was painful to look at. It seemed to be working. Uh, it works in basically any, any web browser. You don't have to install anything. It works on servlets, server containers as, as a portlet, most logs, most IDEs. So you saw the Eclipse plugin, but there is. Also, a uh, plugin for IntelliJ, or actually, uh, IntelliJ nowadays comes while it built, while it support built in. So, you just create a new project and it, it does, would you like to add while it over there. In NetBeans, there is a nice plugin in the NetBeans, uh, how do you call it? NetBeans directory or NetBeans, something like that. So, when, when all the NetBeans plugins come, there is also a really nice part plugin for it. Uh, there is Good set of archetypes for Maven. You could use one for building body if you really want to. So what happens at the moment with body? The new release of body 7.1. Actually, maybe we could have some questions in this in between before we go what's happening next. We have one. Uh, did you enjoy the application even on a web server? Yes. <coughs> No, I don't have to change anything. So, so I can just package the bar and put this in, in, into any, any, any server. Uh, that said, if that would be a portlet, then that would be why. Instead of using body server, I would use body portlet as a wrapper. Just because the those ideas are different. For the browser side, no differences whatsoever. It, it kind of reminds me a lot to .NET, uh, I mean, the HP .NET. The way it works, the way you, um, the way you make the pages, or the way you make the component. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it, would it be very hard for you to compare it a little with other frameworks that kind of focus in the same way as you? So I, I would say that the, the closest uh, frameworks in, in, in that sense, how they work internally, uh, ZK it is uh, probably the most similar framework on how they work. Also, Eclipse Rock is, is quite similar. Uh, so the difference is to 
to a, a good drop is that they are using SVD API for everything, so it's a good desktop light uh, for a bit too much desktop light uh, from the API perspective, so it doesn't have too many users at the moment. For the ZK, the APIs are pretty similar to Wari, but the difference is that instead of using with uh, under the hood for rendering, they use just JavaScript. So there it's either writing JavaScript or the client side or writing server-side Java code. In Vardin you have like three options, server-side Java, client-side Java and client-side Java code. Um, one other framework would be pretty similar. I guess these are the most similar ones. Uh, what we combine with mostly is uh, GXD, that's a common library on top of GUID, so it has Similar level of richness for the UI components, but the approach is, is to write it on the client side instead of writing on the server side. Uh, also, more about with AngularJS because it's a hot new trend. Uh, the difference is actually quite, quite a lot because the AngularJS is, is working on a different, like more low level, there is no similar component libraries. But even so, companies are taking a look into that. For JSF, I don't know. We, I haven't seen anybody that was switching from one to CSF. Other drivers I have seen many people recording. Also, same goes with the Flex. Flex, is, Flex was pretty nice, but it's, because it's pretty much dead, people are looking for other options. Yeah, we were asking. Yeah, is there, is there any way to split the uh, presentation definition from the uh, logic or the business code? Are you thinking just the way it does JavaFX with yeah. the yeah, there are multiple ways. So one way would be to kind of write the view class <coughs> separately. Actually, quite a few <coughs> persons are using like MVP frameworks with Vardin, so that they recreate the presentation class and the view class separately. And there are multiple frameworks available on top of Vardin as well. Uh, some like to have declarative UI, since they're writing things in Java, they want to use XML, so there is uh, XML dialog called Clara for Vardin, so basically you can write any kind of UI in the XML as well. Yeah. Um, what else would we have? I guess those are the main, main ways of separating it. Uh, it's, it's a matter of opinion. This framework doesn't kind of force you into any... Um, it, it's not that populated framework. We just handle the UI layer and it's up to you how you use the UI layer. And then guys are building frameworks on top of that, kind of forcing that they always use Eclipse link behind it that always use MVP to, to kind of structure your UIs. So we kind of give you option of choosing whichever ways you want to use to, to structure your UIs. I was thinking just to, to give the definition of the UI just to a team. Maybe they are not uh, developers, so they are designing that UI. Yep. And it's good to, to separate with an um, XML, for instance. Yeah, that's one way of doing that. Uh, inside our company, what we mostly do is that the UX designers, uh, they build... Uh, there are basically Java developers that build uh, from the wireframes something that somewhat resembles what, what is needed. Like, the components are there, they are pretty much in the correct order, but all the margins and colors are all. Uh, designers build uh, like things that work like mockups and then the theme is tuned, uh, used to tune the components to look exactly like the mockup. That's the way how we are doing it. There are multiple no ways. Yes? We do uh, have some people who assemble do assemble the various components, but some of that they will be bound to need to modify the scope. How is it? How is it? Show up. 
what's new in Wallet 7. There are so many things that are, are in there. Actually, there are like 70 or so new features in Wallet 7. So that's going to not go there. But I, I saw a couple of things that I, I like in Wallet 7.1. So the first interesting thing is, is how we're going to merge Google Web Cooking to be a part of Wallet. So I don't know if you knew, but Google uh, released uh, Google Web Plugin uh, to a steering committee two years back, and basically that the steering committee was and its uh, Red Hat Wallet, Samsung, and a couple independents, and Google themselves. So together we we steered going forwards, and at the same time we thought that hey, we have been using this GUI for five or so years now. So we have been. It is supposed to be a red bubble. <laughs> Somehow it vanished. Okay, imagine a red bubble here. So, <laughs> uh, so we have been using it for for five years or so, but we have been basically just kind of using it as a tool. It has been a one-way direction, and, and one is a product. It has been dependent on on it. So we have been asking. Hey, this GUID is not a bit silent lately. What happens to Warden if the GUID goes away? Now, the fact is the GUID is not going away. Google is putting tons and tons of efforts in the GUID, and there are thousands of developers using it full time. But we kind of thought that, hey, this is a sort of concern. So we should be able to kind of support the whole package. So we actually took a copy of GUID and put that inside Warden. So it basically has all the tooling from GUID built in. But of course, what we keep is you guys should make it the mainstream GUID and our copy of it. So we are working with, with the rest of the GUID community and, and giving back as well. But everything it makes VAR and GUID compatible. So you take any GUID project and it actually runs VAR in the modifications. But the most interesting thing is that now you have there are two program models in VAR. We have the server side model that is really optimized for productivity, it's really fast built stuff. And then you have client side model that is really optimized for control. So if you want to kind of have some control, you can actually have to do anything. You can do everything with with with, with APIs inside body. Do more drop manipulation even for stuffy browsers that are really bleeding edge. Architecture, how this kind of two things fit together. So basically all modern applications they have two parts on the server side. There is a UI and there is a backend. These can be running on different servers or on, on the same server. And REST is optional. So this is a that proper wide application. UI is built out of ready made components. You can build your own components, you can use ready made add-ons. These are just plain old job objects on the server side. Uh, when you want to build new components that do totally something else with DOM that cannot be done by combining the existing components, exactly what you were asking for, you actually build a new widget. This is a good widget. And these two guys are in sync. So, for example, button, there's a button widget and there's a button component. And the idea is that the button widget over here it is responsible for rendering it, it is responsible for catching UI events. And then these two guys are responsible for keeping uh, the states are in, in sync and, and sending the events over. So in a way, these components encapsulate all the kind of tricky stuff in, in web development, and this button component just provides a simple Java API in the backend, so that to you as a developer, so you start using it. There is a theme on top of that. You can also add UI logic on the client side. And if you are a UI logic over here, then you have to build some kind of service later to feed the UI logic. Do you think of the API skip? Interesting over here. SAS! How many of you have been using SAS? Only one guy. Uh, whether you are interested in one or not, take a look at this. This is awesome. Uh, awesome a way of abstracting away from CSS. I can actually give a big. Our problem was that one has many nice looking themes, but those themes tend to be quite complicated because they try to support many different browsers. They are long, 
and there are many, many things inside. Uh, so what we did uh, was that we built our own SaaS compiler that basically compiled from, from uh, kind of super of CSS into CSS. So you can do, have things like variables in CSS, like there is a variable defined in blue and the color is, where it is? I'm not using it over, I'm not using it, I'm just actually calculating a new color out of that, so a bit darker blue. So if I put zero for that over here, it should be the same blue, like this, or if I put, let's say this is red, compile, I would have red, if I put uh, a bit darker red, compile, and so forth. So we can kind of have variables that we are using all over the place, we are calculating other values out of them, then we can just good kind of put uh, selectors inside other selectors to drop the code a bit and you can also <coughs> create mixings to kind of reuse pieces of CSS and, and that kind of gives really powerful notation to build lateral themes this is actually example also in, in, in sampler so if you want to kind of so see different uh, non-functional stuff in one there is a lot of Samples for both as well. Yeah. Uh, forms. Uh, basically, in the previous modern version, there was also a way of building forms. I was pretty proud of it when I designed that in the year 2002. And it is like basically, you create a beam, you take a form component, like this will form component. And you then bind this beam inside the form, and boom, you have a form that is fully functional. Except that in practice, it's a port you want to well. As you can see, for some reason, the birth date is before the first name, and the salary is having a strange dot over here. So there are a lot of things that you want to customize. From a developer point of view, it was brilliant, and then somebody actually started using it and said that this looks like crap, so we have to customize it. And then you end up actually to kind of change it a bit, change the order and so forth. You end up building this ugly uh, generator, generate a different kind of fields for me. And it basically had this long if else hack that noticed that hey, if this happened to be a birthday field, then I do this and that. So in one second, we actually kind of change this to be like from implicit or to, to really explicit way of declaring fields. So you have create a layout, put some fields inside there, configure them as always, some like basic stuff that you could do with the visual editor on by hand. And after that you use field group to bind these all together. So it's a really nice way of building uh, field forms for Uh, then we kind of redesign the communication mechanism. This is basically the way how you build new components. Uh, let's go to new mechanism. So basically, this is the server side component over here, or the server side bottom component, and the client side bottom component. And these are connected to each other by putting a connector class in between. So this guy is kind of responsible for keeping these two guys in sync. And what we provide is two way uh, RPC calls. So you can call from connector to the component over the wire and vice versa. And then there's this add state mechanism that basically uh, is just a normal Java class, any kind of Java class that contains any kind of other Java classes that is owned by the component. And when you make any changes to that state on the server side, it automatically is sent to the client side. So we're going to guarantee that if you are maintaining the state here on the server side, all of that state is readable from the client side automatically, without any kind of interaction from you. And this is like really easy way of, of building these components. Skip the code here as well. Then we added JavaScript based add-ons, so maybe you can use JavaScript to build new components as well. Uh, or take any existing 
JavaScript based widgets and, and run these with views and so on. Just a quick overview of how it looks like. So basically, from Java, you can publish uh, any callbacks. You just say uh, get JavaScript and add a function. So when this actually ends up in your, in your document, so that you can call from uh, window dot find callback. And when that is called on your web page, the call is routed back to your uh, server side, and you can do something with that. Same thing the other direction from jump uh, from I don't know the example here, but basically from from server side you can always call also uh, JavaScript methods on the client side. And then you can there is a thing called JavaScript wrapper that can be used <coughs> to create uh, server side API pretty easily for any any JavaScript components. I don't go into details as you haven't been using one that much that it would be first thing to, to do, but have to let you know that it is there. Server so push, this is really exciting thing that we added. And I don't know how many of you have tried to implement server push in, in any application. Big web sockets? Yes, no. It's quite painful. We thought that it's easy to add push to a framework, quite a good atmosphere framework. And what we were wrong, we have been debugging that for nine months since we, we kind of took the ready made framework and started using it. It was full of bugs and we, we are fixing many, many, many of those. But now the state is such that you can basically take any application, like let's see our application over here. Uh, guess how, what it takes to, to actually make this, uh, to use WebSockets instead of, of uh, Ajax. So everything, all, all the communications that we have are moved to the web sockets. Exactly, so <laughs> you have to cheat it. You could bring something before and I'll show it. So it's if you run this in a debug mode. Seven hundred 
this book about it that is free and downloadable online in PDF or HTML or um, EPUB format or whatever is the preference. So that's a pretty easy way to kind of get dive into why. And everything that I showed you is compatibilized, so it's free for any kind of purposes. And there is a pretty big community around it. We don't really know how big this is just a guess. We are seeing around 100, what do 1.3, 1.4 million uh, unique visitors on the yearly basis of the one.com and having like 75,000 registered users of the one.com. I don't know, we, we guess that it's around 100,000, more than 10,000. Um, I could show something what's happening at the moment for Bali if you are interested or if you are interested in asking more questions or what should we talk about? Client side real 
is that we uh, have a sense of and state of the server side. So we store the component tree in the server memory. And depending on your application, basically depending on how many uh, UI components you have in memory, visible, real, in, in your application, it might be from some tens of kilobytes to some hundreds of, of kilobytes of memory. In some cases, I would even see like one mega, two megabytes of memory, but in those cases, those developers have done something wrong, like putting a ton of data inside the table. Uh, so if you think servers have like 16 gigs of heap, you can actually put quite a few applications in those, those servers. So that is actually a relevant problem. In all the applications that we have been uh, do where we have been doing a performance analysis, it's almost always the, the backend uh, or the uh, or the piece of logic that has been the kind of bottleneck. Uh, there's a really nice uh, scalability test case at Vaan and Wiki. So basically built for Amazon a ticketing system that uh, shows how to scale up to some 35,000 operating users with three Tomcat servers and uh, like a uh, really nice stable backend <laughs> on the top of a memcache idea and, and write only uh, MySQL databases. So, and even in that case, the, the actual problem tended to be that the memcache idea congregates so much between a distributed hashtags that that salary in the most CPU. Do you want to last some you require some kind of stickiness because of this uh, yeah, state. Yeah, we recommend everybody to use sticky sessions. It's, it's not... Uh, some people think that it's a bad idea to begin with, but at the end of the day, it's quite simple way of clustering your, your UI. And, and one thing to remember also is that these UI servers, it's basically they are storing the UI state. It's not nothing that critical that you should actually kind of serialize and, and uh, distribute for, for each HTTP request. It's the same thing as, as in the client side real application, if somebody references a browser window, they basically lose all the state from the UI component tree. So in our case, let's say if UI server would crash totally, the hardware would melt, what happens is that you basically lose the UI state take for those uh, sessions that are stored over there. So it's the same thing as, as the user would click reference button on the web browser. It's not that catastrophic. The business logic is probably running in somewhere else anyways. And I was thinking about an elastic environment where you are setting up and going down with servers. Yes. Um, maybe, of course, you, if you have stickiness, it's easier. But I, I, I was wondering if the, the server can recover the state in the event of, yeah, one, yeah, one yeah. server. You can, see, the is serializable, so you can basically use all the Java E techniques for okay. actually uh, moving the session from one server to another. Okay. That's supported, and uh, I think it's a bit of an overkill for most applications, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't use that to remove it. I have still time for one Thank you. 
framework for, for a while, but it's, it's pretty old. So, okay. so basically, uh, the RPS was designed over 10 years ago, and we originally supported basically rendering to static web pages. So we built all kinds of internal offerings that are used uh, in the beginning of the XSLD pipeline and whatnot. These are well hidden inside the table component. So if you look as a user and don't see these, but it makes the maintenance of the component pretty hard and the customization of the component pretty hard. So it's quite a static component. Either you use the pieces that it has or you might try to work around these and build something on top of it, but it's super hard to do. So that's one limitation. Performance, uh, it's pretty fast, but it could be much faster. Especially if we want to use hardware acceleration on all the mobile touch devices because they don't have too much power. And some of the key features like frozen columns are missing. So because of this, we have been kind of reading, building a new grid for years now, and now we are finally doing that on top of our principles. So, <coughs> because the last grid was around for 10 years, we want the next one to be the best grid in the world and, and, and grid that could be available for 10 to 10 years. So it is basically everything, it is all about extensibility. So you can extend everything, you can change everything in the grid. Uh, there are, in addition to the server sample, there are two APIs, client side and the server side. So you can use that in any kind of application, whether it's a server application or client applications. And they're a really fancy way of, of making it super fast. I can show that. It was so disappointing when, when we have been uh, planning this fancy way of making it super fast for a while. And then we were raising this quick create conference. Uh, we had six and a half hundred quick developers in the conference and, and Google basically announced the conference that they had just released this uh, new Google, Google spreadsheet. I don't know if you have used it, released in December, rewritten in Google from scratch, and it has this exactly the same mechanism, so they have basically came up with the same dome structure for making it super fast. <coughs> so it's not novel anymore. Uh, some of the kind of things that we are doing over there is who is coming up with cell tables or cell widgets? So the pattern is such that uh, instead of putting new widgets inside each, each of the cells, we allow you to build renderers that on a low dome level can do anything with those cells. So normally, the renderer they just get text and they render that text in the dome. But they could also get like, let's say, array and could draw interactive graphics in all the cells, so you can do basically anything in Windows. Uh, there are slides that are data sources. Uh, editor roles <coughs> are such that you, you know, in transferring a table, the way to make it editable is, is to put a lot of UI components in the table cells, and this is super heavy. So, when in, in table normally all the cells all the columns are, are basically containing similar data cells. So this column is just text, and the next column is just data, and so forth. Uh, one could actually reuse editor uh, components in a such way that you just build one row of editor components, and whichever row the user clicks, those same components are moved to that row and bound to that row on the slide. And then we wanted to make upload the sort that you can put totally unlimited amount of, of uh, rows in it. And then there are many, many things that we are adding as well. Maybe I'll show how it, it kind of works. So basically, so we have this same uh, triplet. There is the server side grid, the grid was the client side grid and the middle is connector. On the server side, uh, we have data sources, and uh, we have any kind of components, the 
headers and cells that the server put over there. And also you can put these editor rows to adapt to the grid so that your components are reused on, on when the user is editing any of those rows. And the same things are added to the client side. So they are exactly the same things. Plus this renderer mechanism where you can put their own renderers. And on the client side, we actually have split the component to two. There is this thing called escalator, and that's one magical thing inside. So the escalator looks like this. Uh, the idea is that this black box over there is the viewport, so basically your screen. It might be that the web page starts somewhere from here and goes down there, but that's the part of the web page that you really see. So if you're putting a million rows on a table or on a web page, clearly it would explode your memory. So what we do, we put as many rows on, on the web page that are enough to fill them this viewport. And then we start scrolling down, basically this row is moved transparent to the, book, to the top. And this way, actually, you can kind of uh, fool uh, the user to think that there are many, many rows. And because these are moved over so fast, I can not show in practice. Thank you. 
property, you can combine these at the same time. So if the defaults look like this, over here, we could change the, the same component to look uh, a bit more like metro by making them flat. Or we could change the theme to be like real dark just by changing some simple high level directives. And the key over there is not just like doing CSS tricks, but we could actually, but whatever things we are changing over here, for example, we have this uh, customized red danger button done for just this example, we could change the color of the, of the button to go from being white or kind of fixed to be white to be in relationship to this uh, background color. It's warning color and now it's a darker than the warning color. So now it looks like a dark red, but if I go to, let's say, more traditional theme, it's like still has those same properties. So we could actually build new themes real quick by just defining properties that hey, this customer wants to have flat new type of theme, it should be quite rounded, it should um, have these company colors, these fonts and whatnot. So you can kind of generate multiple themes really fast with, with this kind of device. I guess that was most of it. Uh, I could tell, or maybe I could tell a lot more about, about those type of applications, but it's a long story. How many of you are still related with uh, you are building your, 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 your interface, but at the end you are like building your API, or less, you are, for example, chatting something and then the server is retrieving your information in a different way, or, and then how possible is to using the value you shouldn't do that. It, the API is over there, but it's, it's built for those. You mean public? Uh, is the API that is between that client side button and server side button. It's a bit strange API for generic use. So instead, what you should be doing, you should just use Chuck's. Uh, <coughs> Chuck's big to, to publish RESTful APIs if you want to use the same backend with that they are for a phone. Okay, thank you guys.